Hello, how are you doing? I have just finished reading Fire Rush by Jacqueline Crooks, and this novel is mesmerizing. It's innovative, it's revelatory, and I found it completely immersive. So I want to briefly give some of my thoughts about this book. And you know how there are some stories that feel like they've been building up in the author's mind throughout their entire life, and that is the case with Fire Rush. Uh, it's a debut novel, and it's said of the author on the back flap that Jacqueline Crooks grew up in 70s and 80s South Hall, part of London's migrant community carving out a space through music, culture, and politics. Immersed in the gay underworld as a young woman, she later discovered the power of writing and music to help her look outwards and engage differently with the world, a power that has driven her ever since. So at the center of this novel, and it's narrated by a character named Yame, uh, who is living through this same period of time of the late 70s and early 80s in London, and she spends her nights going out clubbing with friends uh, at a venue that caters to the emerging dub music scene. But when a promising relationship is tragically cut short uh, because of a racist attack by the police, she finds herself thrust into a movement of protest and criminality that leads her uh, from London to Bristol to Jamaica. And at one point in the novel, um, she muses, I wonder if one day I'll write a song, a sound memorial for the times we had, those winter nights of music and heat, a sase, rumor, moose, and me. And this novel feels like that memorial uh, because even though it is fiction, uh, it is filled with all of the uncertainty and perilousness of young adulthood and the prose are infused with the music of British African Caribbean culture. What's immediately striking about this novel is how it captures the voice of Yame as a creative young black woman in London. And it does this through the narration, uh, but also through the dialogue. Uh, so she's living with her emotionally distant father in a housing estate. Uh, she's working at a really tedious job and she longs for a connection with her absent mother. But what makes her really come alive is going out clubbing with her friends and immersing herself in the music scene and writing lyrics in her head, uh, which sometimes burst out um, in these improv sessions when she finally takes to the mic. Uh, so it's really exciting um, seeing those scenes and how her creativity is, is really bursting out um, through these different sessions. And it's really notable how, although she draws um, inspiration and support from the community around her, there's also a degree of animosity. Uh, there are some sections where um, she just describes how there are just very few options available to her when she is in these clubs and men will come up and grind against her, uh, but also at later points um, when police come knocking at her door, um, how there are really few options available to her of, of how she can react to and respond to this. Also, her strong-willed close friend Asase is an ally, uh, but she also frequently belittles Yame. And there is this larger building tension between Yame and her community and the larger British establishment uh, or Babylon, um, as it's frequently referred to in this book, um, in which uh, Babylon will spy upon her and members of her community and target them. It's inspiring witnessing Yame's growth over the course of this very dramatic story. Uh, although she encounters tragedy and heartbreak and violence, and she channels this into artistic expression, um, but she also courageously fights to carve out a space for herself that can feel like home. So I've seen responses from some readers that have commented that they didn't understand uh, some of the language in this book, but I think you can get a sense of what's being said through 
the context and as you're reading along uh, it builds up this this sense and this rhythm of the the story uh, that that I just fell into and I mean I, I didn't get all of the the references like I'm not too familiar with the history of, of dub music um, but I did get a sense of the, the impact and the meaning and the feeling of this music through the, the prose. Um, and also it took on like a personal meaning for me because I mean, I'm American, but I've lived here in London uh, for a long time, um, specifically in South London, in an area very close to the one that is portrayed in this novel. And close to where I live, there is a mural of black protest and this really came alive for me as I read a certain section of this novel uh, which portrays a protest and a conflict between a far-right group and members of the local community and the police. Um, so I want to read out this section because I think it's really powerful. The drums slow and the crowd quietens as the far-right group march towards us, coming from the direction of the train station, police with batons and shields on either side of them. The lead singer of Misty and Roots shouts over the mic, don't let them in our community, stand strong. One of them blows the Aben horn. The Indians play their tablas in response. Faster and faster, women drop down, gyrate and ululate. Shopkeepers pull down metal grills, drag in crates of fruit and root vegetables that look like the hooves of prehistoric animals. I imagine myself walking up the street, away from the chanting throng, turning the corner, heading home, taking the lift to the empty flat, lighting a spliff, falling asleep to mama's lullaby. Cha, I ain't going nowhere. The dry layers of loss and loneliness in my body have been lit. I'm ready to walk through smoke, come out the other side. I chant with the crowd, fire rush, fire burn. Men lean in doorways, balanced on one leg, heads cocked like guns, waiting for the call to kick off. Bongo Natty is standing outside Dub Steppas with the crypt posse. He shakes his dreadlocks as I walk towards him. I try to speak, but he looks at me hard, two lines between his eyes. Go a ya yard, he says, September's gonna burn. He marches off to the center of the crowd, springing from his toes. The Aben blows three times as the police and the far-right group come to the edge of the crowd. Babylon push through and suddenly there's a hot breath, whoosh, whoosh, as a Molotov cocktail flies through the air towards them. Synth splashes and molten spurts, the smell of palm oil and petrol. The crowd charge the police, surging off the black tarmac road with heroic badness. Peel-head boys, rastas, shaven-haired punks, women with cane rows and rebel hoop earrings, dropping all kinds of moves with supernatural war cries, whistles and wailing. Some of them bust through fist fighting with men inside the barricade, grunts and shouts, the sound of truncheons licking shields and skulls and backbones, someone over a loudspeaker shouting, Riot Squad! And then the sound of horse hooves as caped police on horseback ride towards us, waving lawn white truncheons. People run in all directions, the explosive noise of glass brucking up, fires popping, shop alarms clanging. The far right group is fighting with our rebels in small groups, a tall, wiry man running at them, shouting, Bruck them up, bruck them up! His navy balaclava dominated by the burning red O of his mouth. Two men with slingshot, pellet eyes are standing on top of an upturned car, pounding it like a steel drum. Police on horseback fly at them like bats. The church bell is ringing and ringing and smoke pours out of a shop on the street. A pile of crates in the road burns, flames lapping the air. It is such a striking scene and I'm going to continue to think about it every time I pass by this mural that's close to where I live. Uh, it is just filled with such evocative physical detail and it really conveys the emotional atmosphere and tension of this confrontation that's 
occurring in the streets. A visceral pain and anger for the way that minorities have been systematically marginalized and discriminated against in this country is conveyed throughout the entire novel and Yemei is deeply aware of the subjugation that her ancestors experienced uh, on a day-to-day -day basis um, from the sugar she consumes uh, to the nightmares that continuously plague her. The story also meaningfully deals with the complexity of how we move forward as a society with options that range from complicity to flight to extremism, but by following Yamei's heartrending journey, we experience the personal impact and difficulty of these larger events and debates. There are ongoing storylines of who from this local community might be snitching to the police, uh, but also what actually happened to Yamei's mother. Um, so these add elements of mystery to the story, which really like drove me on to keep reading because I wanted to, to find out the answers um, as well as discover what actually happens in Yamei's life. And although I was compelled overall by the story, there were some elements of the plot that I felt were a little clunky. Circumstances surrounding a friend's incarceration are handled a little too swiftly. Uh, also, there are some encounters that rely a bit too much on coincidence. And uh, the ending of the novel I just found a bit too melodramatic. Also, some of the short dream sequences dealt a bit too literally with the novel's central subjects, but these are minor quibbles overall, like considering the vibrancy and uniqueness of the prose here. It's such a moving experience following the way that Yamei grows and transforms over the course of the novel. And this story may be set in the past, but there's a real urgency to Crook's writing, which successfully pays tribute to a movement and a music scene, which may not be part of mainstream history, but its influence can still be felt today. So what an excellent novel. Uh, I would love to know if you've also read this book and what you thought about it. Uh, please let me know about that in the, the comments below. Or if you're keen on reading this novel now, please let me know about that as well. Uh, but thank you for watching. I hope you're doing well and reading good things. And I'll speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.